we welcome today someone who um, knows a lot about Oregon because she's been here and working in therapy in school since uh, 2006. And she's got a rich history in sensory integration, um, multi-tiered systems of support. And I, it is a, it has been a pleasure to grow a relationship with Manaz over the last eight years. And she presented at conferences. And today she's going to be sharing some ideas that are not brand new, but it's going to help connect the dots for those of you who are working and trying to find ways uh, to support more students when there's no more money. So I'm going to invite Manaz to start sharing her screen um, and take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. So today's uh, workshop is going to be about talking about tier one support and um, kind of inverting our service delivery model from the reactive, which is the tier three, waiting for the evaluation to serve students to being more proactive and using our larger lens of our um, OT lens, thinking about things like the environment, um, how to support whole class um, classrooms so we can get um, more buy-in and more um, see more kids with less evaluations. So let's start with shout outs, um, either chat or in the, um, or just unmute yourself. If you could be the ideal school-based therapist, what would you do differently today to meet all students' needs? What does that look like for you? More UDL, more staff After trainings. Okay, on the right track. <laughs> Clone myself. Okay, kindergarten and preschool. Yes. Break spaces. So changing the environment up. Break space. <laughs> Break space is available for all. Ah. So calm corners, regulation spaces, and MTSS style without needing to restrict support. Okay. But PD against behavior strategies. Yes. Communication, sensory regulation, emotional regulation. So um, today I'm going to share with you what I've done in the past and kind of using the principles of where we're at in um, IDEA and then um, looking at ESSA and how we can start to build um, the bridges so that we can start to be more proactive. So when we think about the MTSS and the RTI approach, what are the guiding principles? It's really about multiple means of engagement. So as an OT, I think about the environment first, because with the environment, you can start to support the regulation. Because without regulation, we can't access um, education. And then we're looking at adaptation to the learning tools. So again, when we do that holistically, we can actually tap into so much just globally without even having to change and wait for the student to be um, identified as needing therapy interventions. And then multiple means of representation is using our analysis, our task analysis, helping teachers understand what scaffolding materials are, maybe universal design for picture, picture symbols, visual schedules. Um, how can you make that available for all students? And then high tech using uh, more of the multi-dimensional, um, you know, increasing your volume for your classroom using um, universal design for um, speakers, using music in the background, using more videos, um, having more exit strategies. So just really thinking about how can we maximize all students' um, needs rather than just identified individual needs. And then also uh, multiple means of actions and expression, whoops. Um, are there other ways for kids to share their uh, outcomes, share what they know? 
Um, we've been doing a lot of this, like, can we have them do oral presentations at the younger grades? Can they create posters and talk about their posters? Um, in the in the middle schools and high schools, can they do more power strips, um, PowerPoints and do comic strips, drawings, acting out stories, uh, speech to text and typing? We're really pushing typing in the elementaries now at around third grade all the way to fifth grade. So we're trying to really push for that in a UDL sense. Um, we're getting more and more teachers willing to put away 15 minutes a day of their writing into typing and practicing typing. What happens when we do that is we, be, we remove the barrier for access for all students as part of that tier one process. And actually that helps us as OTs become more valuable. So here's just a statement, everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will leave its whole life believing that it's stupid. How many times do you go into a classroom and you're like, that kid could benefit from what I'm doing with this kid X who's on my caseload? So I always tell my teachers, take your most involved student and use all these strategies and it'll benefit all students in your classroom in different ways. So it really does remove the frustration for teachers. Um, um, so just be thinking more like turning your model and inverting it to more of, um, okay, wait, I've got to, okay. So, whoops. so according to um, IDA, can you guys see the whole screen or is my, it's my whoops. You're good. Okay, I'm good. Okay. I don't know why my screen's not. Hmm. Sorry. How weird. Why is my screen not showing? Hmm. Um can you hit escape. Escape. You guys can see my screen? Yes. How weird, I'm seeing you guys. Not the very bottom though. Okay, you're not seeing the bottom, but you can see the top? Yes. We're, okay. So 15% under IDA, the revisions that were done, 15% of IDA funds should be going to a proactive, um, those that are not identified on SPED. So really we should be tapping into that universal design and we should actually be looking at proactively, how can we support kids before they need to go to SPED? And then ESSA that came in, it's actually putting um, the legislation's explicit supports of occupational therapists, especially um, specialized instructional support personnel. And so again, those two um, legislative material is actually giving us a bigger and broader sense of we're no longer just under the umbrella of IDA. We now can combine our forces and be under that bigger umbrella. And again, the whole idea is to invert our use of our expertise so that we are not just being a narrow-minded focus. We're actually using all of our services in the broader sense. So when I think about how you can be an OT at the universal level, it's promoting health um, sensory processing for regulations, stress reduction activities. All of this can be done in the classroom, teaching them whole class regulation. In the cafeteria, I look at um, how can I reduce the stimuli in the cafeteria? How can I increase calmness by putting in music, lowering the lights, using more non-visuals? Um, also learning um, how to do friendship buddies and lunch buddies and helping to bring out more of those meaningful conversations at the younger age. Recess, helping um, IAs and support staff really engage in more pur purposeful interaction. Um, one of the biggest things that I find when I do evaluations is kids don't have bilateral integration, which we know is fundamental to reading, writing, and math. So looking at the recess playground and helping them to find ways to be more interactive with their students rather than letting the kids run around and really don't know how to engage in the playground equipment. I'm sure many of you guys, if you're working with kids, can see that. And it's the motor planning that's interfering with their ability to have purposeful recess time. 
Then also looking at um, leisure for those that need to have hobbies and interests and helping um, teams figure out what types of hobbies and interests that they can have in the classrooms and in, in middle school and high school, what kind of clubs they can be thinking about. And so when we think about universal design, we're thinking about providing opportunities for the few, but support some who need extra help. So when I think about us, the green is really where we should start. Then the tier two is the sum. So that would be more like small group settings or being a specialist that comes in on um, interventions and offering a teacher some strategies to help kids and in interventions. You might be doing an observation, a screening for a student after a parent permission. You might be offering, okay, this is what I'm seeing. Here's some strategies you can consider for X student. And then the few are the more identified students that really need dialed in support from an OT and really working on those underlying issues that are preventing them from accessing their education. So really it's inverting the triangle so that we're working at the all level so that by the time we get to the few, we're really using our task analysis skills and individualizing their needs. So before COVID, this bar is getting in a way. I don't know if there's a way to minimize my bar. Um, Are you seeing your own slides? Yeah, it's just getting in the way. Yeah, I am. Um, um, so before COVID, we were looking at what the barriers were in terms of OT's role. And we didn't, in our district, we don't have a fundamental um, writing program. How many people have that problem in their district where they don't have a fundamental writing program? So they're getting a lot of re referrals for handwriting support or the lack thereof, um, mainly because there's not a, a writing curriculum. Are we having that same problem elsewhere? We were finding that because there's no writing program, the visual integration, the visual motor integration is founded by the variety of eye-hand coordination. And we know with the impact of technology, sometimes that eye-hand coordination is um, reduced. We think that it's an eye-hand coordination activity, but it actually isn't. Um, students were not accessing AT devices in the classrooms because they didn't want to stand out. Um, they rather, um, the emphasis was placed on a student to remember it rather than a joint effort of the teacher and the student. Teachers were feeling um, intimidated by use of technology. So they were kind of shying away from it for the student that needed it. Um, staff holding a work was very limited before access to uh, the technology. So there was a lot of environmental barriers, supporting posture, writing tools, um, lighting, all of these things we were noticing before COVID, which then all of these ended up becoming pro, pro productivity, decreased confidence and impaired, impaired peer relationship. I think we can all see that if we're working in a more inclusive environment where we were uh, accessing OT support for gen ed students that might have um, LRC support or learning resource supports, but they're not really getting the bigger picture of how do they become accessible and how do they meet their needs within an environment that's inclusive. So after COVID, we started to see a paradigm shift. And this is where I am now is just trying to look at how can I help all students so that when I do look at one student, I'm looking at the whole way. So in my school district, before COVID and after COVID, we've been starting to work with the SPED and the OT department on regulations. We got a grant. We were able to create kits for regulation kits. We were training principals, behavior specialists. We used grants, we used PTA funds, and we used school funds. And we started making uh, regulation rooms throughout the district. In your handouts, um, in the resources, you'll see um, a variety of uh, regulation rooms that I help implement and, and create with a child-driven, purposeful um, use. And it's made with the idea that you're activating their um, motor planning, heavy work, 
And it was also based on zones of regulation and kind of adapting it and brain gym. So some of these tools were the, the kits that we use. So it kind of hit kind of all the areas of the sensory system and gave them a platform to start. So the path is being paved. So with the legislation and then um, with more and more places starting to think about how can I be, how can I increase my use of my services without increasing my workload or my demands? And what we found is when we started to invert our thinking to more proactive, our referrals were going down and our work satisfaction was going up. Because once you start to implement the tier one services, people find out who you are and in the staff room, they start talking to you and you're solving problems before you have to even get a referral. So when you get the referral, there really are actual needs that are underlying that you can actually pinpoint. Let's see what's going on. Um, I'm just checking the uh, chat. Okay, so when I think about um, tier one supports, I'm looking at the environment, I'm looking at creating calm corners, various regulation tools to support learning, flexible seating options, and requests of on-site training by the OT. So in your handouts, you're gonna see um, various PowerPoints and um, activities that I've done PD for at the school level, because again, I believe that when you can teach all teachers universal design and ways to access all students, you're actually going to um, have more targeted responses and better outcomes for all your students. And we know behaviors right now are beyond beyond okay. So when I look at environmental supports, I'm looking at flexible seating, and you will also have um, slides, you'll have a PowerPoint that I put into the, um, into the handout where um, I took pictures throughout the district of classrooms that took out traditional um, desk and put in more flexible seating, because we now know, especially after COVID, that kids are not learning in the typical ways. They're learning by, you know, laying on the floor, by putting their feet up in a, a chair, by leaning against a table, sitting on a bench. So you will see how classrooms changed um, the way of looking at um, seating and learning. You will see um, how we use low lighting, how we incorporated calm corners and what they look like, what were the key pieces that were in it use of visual support. So again, not waiting for a student to be identified needing it, but how did we bring in universal designs for visual support? How we incorporate music into the background. We have found, um, teachers have given me feedback on when they put music in the background doing focus work, they actually found that the kids like ADHD or sensory processing actually were starting to see um, better outcomes for focus. Um, then regulation tools, some tools that we started to push universally with the oral motor tools. We know that gum, the heavy work of gum is powerful. Um, when I was living in California um, many years ago, I worked for a school district and the principal at the time, and I was doing a lot of this proactive stuff way back when, so I think I was a visionary then. She said, um, I did a workshop on sensory processing and she said she was gonna implement gum. And she said, if the test scores went up 10%, she was gonna kiss a pig. And her whole school's, um, and it was a low income district, her whole school um, test scores went up. And so she, uh, she alluded to the fact that they implemented a lot of these proactive sensory processing. They had every hour, the principal had a chime and wherever the students were, whether they were in a hallway, whether they were in a classroom, they did a regulation activity and every teacher had to do that. And they implemented GUM doing writing and doing focus time and of course doing testing and they saw the results. So you have to do it proactively because the brain has to map those things beforehand. So something to think about when we think about what do we give for testing and why are we not doing it beforehand? So here are some regulation tools that we have um, considered in our classroom. 
this particular picture was an MP3 player that a student um, used with one earbud. And then she found that she needed tactile to be grounded. And she actually went from a behavior student to a um, focused student that was able to produce writing in middle school. So here's an example of environments, looking at how you can access um, flexible seating in a classroom, how you'll see um, what I like here is that she created that natural motor planning, kind of like where kids can't just come in and just naturally cross over. You have to, because the door is over on this left-hand side. So that you'll see how there's barriers. She defined the areas, um, whether it be by carpets, by areas, um, different things are going on in different areas and kids can um, pick where they go to sit for different things. It was a really nice um, layout that she created. And you'll see other, in my um, handouts, you'll see other classrooms. So you'll get a variety of different ways um, teachers have implemented that. And here are some testimonials of uh, regulation rooms that have been created in different schools. Um, so you can see that when you really are proactive, kids are actually finding benefits. And these are all um, kids' statements that I had teachers start to um, push in and talk about. And I said, can you take back what they're saying? Can you give me feedback on what exactly is happening when you put these things in place? So, um, so as, an, as an OT advocate from the MTSS model um, approach, is really looking at bringing back handwriting, creating a proposal for handwriting pilot. We started that before COVID, but unfortunately our leadership changed and we're in the midst of more leadership changes. So we never got the handwriting off the ground. We brought in handwriting without tears representatives to, to speak to leadership um, using their research model, but it never got off the ground before COVID. So we have to bring that back. Um, being an advocate, expanding your role, moving towards building OT. I know um, in our district, we're really looking at trying to push more the workload versus the caseload. Um, I know in legislative action that's being talked about. But really, when I think about if I'm a building OT, it's how many buildings am I supporting? And so when I'm building, when I'm thinking about a building, I'm accessing all students and I'm accessing students on my caseload. So it's a win-win versus I have 100 kids on my caseload and I go to 10 different schools, but I can reduce that caseload significantly if I'm proactively pushing in and supporting those buildings with PD, with um, universal design, with being in the staff room and being available to ask questions by um, coming in and doing more a small group, being a consultant to small group interventions. So assistive technology, looking at the various programs and hardware, access to all students. So um, since COVID, our district, and I think a lot more districts are having um, Chromebooks or some type of um, assistive technology for all students. What we found is that after COVID, they took away all the platforms that gave them availability to do a variety of um, ways to access their um, uh, curriculum. So you have a Chromebook, but you don't have access to digital support. So we're trying to really push for that. How can we give people platforms so they can have access to speech to text, text box, voice texting, typing, um, you know, PDFs that are um, edible, those kinds of things. So we're working on that now because all they have is Chromebooks. So what's the point if they're not going to use it to access um, audio materials using UDL supports through Chromebook um, extensions? So we're really pushing all of that. Now we have a, a designated AT team that's supporting all that. So it's, it's as an OT, it's such a wide range of support. I mean, not everybody's gonna know everything. Like I'm not the assistive technology guru, but I now know I can tap into my support. So really looking at what are, you, what are your strengths and where can I tap into my other people? And so I was big on sensory processing. So regulation rooms became my area of expertise, helping um, schools understand 
what does it mean to have a regulation room? What does it mean to, because many places will say it's a sensory room. We're all sensory beings. We're really trying to help students regulate, which means they have to get their body to a calm state so they can be ready to learn. And what does that look like? So really giving them the behind the scenes, what does it mean when we say regulation? What do we mean when we say that they're in the yellow zone or the red zone or the blue zone? What does that look like and how do we help them get back to the green zone? And this is using um, more of the um, concept of zones of regulation. Continuous dialogue with teachers, CM, principals, behavior specialists, and support staff. That is critical. Um, I found that my biggest bang for bucks was um, talking to principals at principals meetings, behavior specialists at their job alikes, um, really pushing for principals to have me come in and do staff training at their staff meetings, um, and then coming alongside these people and saying, what can I do to help you? Even if the kid is not on your caseload, you're doing universal de design when you're actually just helping the specialist. You're not happy helping that individual. So it's shifting from, I can only see kids that are on my caseload to I'm not looking at the student, I'm looking at how can I support these people and use my expertise and my brain, um, my understanding of brain mapping to help these people understand how to support their students. And it really starts at the tier one level. Here are some other flexible seatings um, options that were integrated. We use grant money um, to get a lot of this out there. Um, some teachers use Go, uh, what was it? Um, donor choose funds, some uh, bank funds. So various ways that you can help um, teachers find money to get flexible seating. And we know that one, one size does not fit all. Some teachers like everything to look the same. I really try to teach teachers by going in and saying, based on this year's classroom, here's the type of flexible seating I would consider based on what I'm observing, and then offer them feedback and help them work through how to get that stuff for their classroom. And that's been successful. Um, doing COVID, we've learned the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And now we need to really think about how can we bring that to the classrooms? Um, the good was we found that early intervening opportunities support students using accessibility, like we had Seesaw and Cami um, was our platform, and really allowing these kids the accessibility really helped them. Um, having students have access to AIM, um, having learning ally op, um, options for all students in the building. So those were books on tape, um, having them, and then really teaching reading specialists how to look for um, data and what to be looking for in terms of why is the student not progressing. So using your OT lens and your task analysis and really becoming um, a bigger cheerleader for your schools so again, we're doing early intervention and not waiting for the students to be struggling. We found that behaviors went down due to the ability to use technology for written outcome. How many times have you gotten referrals because the kid has got a behavior problem and then you find out when did they really have behaviors? When is the behaviors really happening? It's usually unstructured time, so recess, PE, music, or it's when they're writing. When you put a piece of paper in front of them, that's when you have the shutdown. That's when you have the throwing of the pencil. That's when you have all the issues. So really thinking about um, 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 thinking about, you know, again, can we help them reduce the barrier by offering the universal tools of technology so that a student can actually benefit? from showing you what they know. Um, we had, I had a PD on just talking to teachers at a staff meeting, what is it that you need and what is your style of regulation? And what if you had that access at your school to regulate your body? And when you needed breaks, you had what you needed in the staff room to access breaks. And so we did that. We did a whole staff survey. We did a um, K2 survey. We did a 3-5 survey. And then we analyzed it as OTs and we brought it back to the staff. And it was pretty amazing. And it, the staff even said, just 
being able to speak to what I need helps me have compassion to what my students need. So again, it's inverting the idea that the teacher's in control, because the teacher will always be in control, but when we start to re rethink about how we're accessing students and students' needs, using kind of like Maslow's hierarchy, when we give the child what it needs at the time when a child needs it, can we then increase their intrinsic motivation to want to learn? Just as when a teacher is feeling empowered and regulated, are they gonna be more likely to have more compassion for the heart of student in the classroom? So again, really reinverting that thinking to help teachers say, it's okay, it's okay to know that you need certain things and by being compassionate to yourself, you're gonna have more compassion for your students. So really making them more aware, like they are allowed to chew gum, they're allowed to um, drink water through a straw. Why can't the students have that same access at any time all day long? Why can't they have um, snacks throughout the day when they need it versus only at times when the teacher gives it out? Um, so really, kind of helping teachers understand what they need versus what the students need. Um, so that was the good stuff. And then the bad stuff was students started to shut down and refuse to engage on screen. So some kids, it was overwhelming to be on the screen and doing a virtual platform. There was environmental barriers. Um, some parents weren't able to give their child the routines. Maybe the structure wasn't there. Um, we found that the importance of emotional and self-regulation wasn't there. We saw the inequity um, access. Some kids had access to technology, had strong internet support. Um, so we saw a lot of barriers that also happened during that time. Yes, we asked students to regulate in unregulated environments. Well said, <laughs> well said, yes. Um, I, I just pull my hair out every time I go into classrooms that are just overstimulating. Um, and then here was where we found the opportunities. Um, these are some opportunities that we started to think about in terms of how can we help students at the UDL level. Um, so when we think about accessibility and, and equity, we need to be thinking about alternative learning modalities because again, again all students are learning differently. And so when we think about, do we need to wait for them to be on an IEP? By that time, they've learned bad behaviors and teachers are more likely to be resistant because it's too much for one student to have to think about turning it on, sending it to the scanner to bring it up on a digital platform. So how can they access it for all students and then giving them a choice? Do you wanna do it this way or that way? So here's some ideas of um, alternative le learning modalities to help um, kids. So the paradigm shift using the, the MTSS model, there were fewer referrals for SPED, more time in classroom with peers, inclusive modeling and engagement among students, Fewer transitions to and from supporting environments. So by doing this, you know, if you're still doing new, doing the pull-out model, which our school is not, or our district is not, um, when you bring the stuff to them, you're finding that their workload, their ability to stay on task, their time off task is limited. So thinking about how do we how do we support on task behavior, it's by really shifting the paradigm to more of the tier one level. And it also aligns with IDA. Um, so here are some strategies that we came up with for our district. How could we bring back um, more universal design at the time um, using platforms like the unique curriculum, Google Read and Write, CoWriter, Epic, Learning Ally. So these were some online um, platforms that we used during COVID that were taken away after COVID that we're trying to advocate to bring back so that we can have access for all students. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for a minute and let's chat a little bit about what we're hearing and what we're seeing. Um, okay.
I'm going to see myself now. Um, so based on that, how many of us are actually able to think about using some of this or have been starting to use this in their classrooms already? Can you see the value of an OT in terms of the UDL aspect? Feel free to unmute. I, I want to bring out a point, um, Manaz. I, you know, typically in in the therapy world, um, the funding goes to supporting a student, and so mm -hmm. I think that sometimes doing this kind of a shift to say that how do I come in and look at all students whenever I uh, I get minutes in this IEP, et cetera. You know, I've, I've heard people do at the beginning of the year, go in and just observe all of the kids and say, this kid needs a grip. And, and uh, you know, a lot of that takes communication and collaboration between the ESVs and districts. Just some of the barriers um, that I think people might say, what do you say to those? Um, That's a great question. So um, before I came to Salem Kaiser, I worked for ESD on a contract. And I quickly found, you know, it's one student here in this classroom, one student in that classroom. But what I found was that the issues were the same. And so I, I used that opportunity of that one student and I started to do small workshops. I started to kind of sit in and, and spend more time. Um, I had flexibility in my schedule. So I was starting to really talk to the teacher more and come alongside that student and those kids and just starting to... Um, model for them. And little by little, I got more teacher buy-in. And pretty soon I was asked to do more workshops at the school level, which then offered me more re referrals because I was an ESD. So of course they were trying to find ways for me to keep coming back. And so we kind of did a half and half model where the kids that needed it got the referrals, but at the same time, I was able to support the whole classroom. So we did motor labs like I might've had three kids in three classrooms on a campus that needed motor um, therapy. This was this preschool level. So by creating the motor labs, I was working with those three kids, but I was also there supporting um, kids that were not on my caseload, but coaching those um, IA support, those teachers. So it became a win-win. By the time I left um, that district or that area, they were actually looking at going in-house because they saw the value of just having a direct access OT. Because I think that when we can go direct access or when we can shift the way we think about our students, we're actually making it a win-win because otherwise the student's standing out and you're not seeing the real value because nobody's really implementing it. I saw that sometimes people are getting mints for testing and the test scores go up, but why is it that all year leading up to that, they're not giving mints? What's the rationale behind that? And really trying to shift the mindset of a student that has an accommodation for oral motor, but how can we help all students have access to oral motor in the classroom? So Johnny's not the only one standing out because then it's bullying, right? But then we're looking at bullying and I don't want to stand out, so I'm not going to do it. So we're not even using the accommodations the way we should. So really shifting how we use our time directed to a student and how can we maximize and kind of stretch ourselves and say, if I have an hour with the student, what else can I do? Cynthia. So one of the things I, I'm working in the Tacoma School District, I know I have a lot of coworkers here, hello. Um, it's the ethics sometimes of doing a handwriting program in a school that the teacher should be doing. And then just working with that kindergarten class or that first grade class. And I do that. I'll go in and, and teach handwriting for everyone. It's a great, great model. But then I'm like, there's an awful lot of prep, an awful lot of budget I'm not given. And part of me is like, the the the, the teachers should just do it. And I don't want to enable the district to think that they have something successful that shouldn't be done by me. That is a general education teacher duty. So... Um, and then let's say I pull a ton of my time all to that class, but, um, not to all these other people, there's, there's the ethics behind it. Um, 
And I, I, I try very hard, especially in the middle schools, to get out of doing one-on-one um, education of technology when the teacher should be doing it. In fact, I, I just kind of refuse to do it now. I'll just put right in there. I mean, I see the need for this one child, but frankly, I do my best to discharge them and put it in the accommodations page and hold the team responsible. Frankly, if I'm teaching a general ed subject that should be taught by the teacher, then they think it's being done well when it's not. My my 20 minutes, especially pulling a kid out of a half a class of a middle school class every week is if anything dangerous. Um, and they think they've solved the problem when the problem is them. The problem is the group. And I don't want them to think they've solved the problem of their school and, and, a, and a student's access to what should be just normal universal curriculum. That's my thoughts. Yeah. And I would agree with you. And that's why I started to shift my mentality that in order to get buy-in from a gen ed teacher, from a school, from you know middle school, I have to do training at the baseline. So let's say I have three kids on my caseload that have I don't know, let's say once a month, 30 minutes, I might combine those 30 minutes into one hour training for the whole staff. So now Mm -hmm. you've impacted the whole school, right? So you gave them the general knowledge. So then when you tap into their classroom and they see you, they're like, oh yes, Johnny is, you know, I mean, so you're just, you're taking your knowledge base and saying, I'm going to change my frustration level and my ethics and saying, okay, if I'm on a limited budget, I don't, I don't believe personally, and this is just my personal professional opinion. We were not going to school to become handwriting therapists. We are looking at the underlying cause of what's limiting them from accessing handwriting. So if there's no curriculum, you know, so we can do a tier one and show them some strategies, but we're not going to impact the overall um, writing curriculum if the teacher is not using your strategies, right? And I see Amy has her hand up, but I, I wanted to make a comment about overall um, across our state, we've talked about how misunderstood the role of the therapist is. And particularly by admin, every training we have, we say, well, how can we get admin on the same page? But um, when we look at the role, again, it's confused. I think somehow we need to be talking to administrators to say just the things that you just did, Cynthia, that my scope of practice is this. Yes, I support, but helping your team uh, to do these things is going to bake this into your pies rather than rely on a therapist who... Uh, needs to be working with more uh, complex issues. And so uh, I want to just plant, I know we have at least one administrator on, and so I just want to plant, what is it that speaks to admin? And we've already talked about money. So if we can relate the the, the keeping less kids from advancing into the more complicated peer levels, uh, supporting the, what is it that sways admin and anytime you can relate it back to here's it's going to part of it's going to be about money how can you quantify that so if you have strategies or verbiage or uh, buzzwords that you use in talking to admin how can we get them on board so i find that um right now keeping teachers keeping support staff the burnout rate at least in our district, is really high. The morale is low. I mean, kids are spitting and kicking and, you know, everything under the sun, that when you can talk to an admin and say, look, I can come in and do a self-regulation workshop. I can do an environment workshop. And then you work with the admin and say, are you committed to implementing, you know, regulation strategies for the whole class throughout your whole, you know, from kindergarten to fifth grade, elementary, or wherever you're going, ten like giving them five minutes at the beginning of every, um, uh, like writing, reading, writing, you know, every category, getting these kids five to ten minutes to do a regulation and get their bodies ready to learn, 
And then we come back in six to eight weeks and we talk about how's the morale changing? What's, what's, what's positive? You know, are you seeing less referrals, behavior trackers? Are you seeing kids starting to feel good about coming to school? Because for an admin, it's all about having to deal with the bad behaviors, the parents that are frustrated, the kids that are failing. You know, you want test scores to go up. But if they don't understand how environment regulation and support tools empower, and that is really an OT's niche in the schools, is access. But when we're doing it in a negative way because we can't change the environment or we can't in implement the small pencil or you know the texts are too high and we know how that impacts um, writing, we you know there's so many pieces that we have knowledge on that if we invert that and start talking to principals and say, let's talk about your behavior trackers. What's your biggest problem in your school right now? Let's talk about the top three. And then you as the expert can say, is this anything that I can do from my lens to help them? More than likely, we're gonna be able to help them. More than likely, I can tell you based on what I've done, we have so much we can offer them. Um, so thinking about it from a kind of a partnership, because IDA money is not tied to one student gives me X amount of dollars as a therapist. We are under the umbrella of the law. And then under ESSA, that's a gen ed law that then brings us into a bigger scope. So yes, if you're an ESD, I would say combine your minutes and tie that into your students because you're indirectly and directly helping your teachers by offering them the greater scope of what you're doing. So when you come in and you bring that tool to them, they're no longer, oh yeah, it didn't work because Susie's feet are not touching the ground. Well, now they understand the importance of that because you spoke to it at a universal level versus trying to find them 10 minutes in a day when they don't have it or at an IEP, try and explain yourself. So it's- really Excellent, excellent comments. And I don't want to, I'm sorry, Amy, you had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to jump over that, but I wanted to make that comment and plant some seeds for any admin. Amy, what was your question or comment? Uh, it, it kind of, in a roundabout way, got answered. Um, in our district, we've um, assisted in implementing the Calming Corners uh, sensory rooms. Um, we even now have TOSAs that are kind of working on the social emotional regulation of, of students throughout the district. Um, but what we're finding as OTs is we, we're, we put in sensory pathways in our elementary schools. Like we find that we can get things started and set up, but nothing lasts. Uh, our rooms will disappear for our sensory spaces because they need to be used as behavioral <laughs> intervention spaces or um, a new classroom got added to the school or whatever. Um, it's kind of exhausting, um, to be honest, to keep up with the maintenance of um, these programs. There's only two of us in our district. We're not a huge district, but um, any like ideas, and you kind of already touched on it about the relationships with administrators and and continuing to talk about the benefits of these supports um but any other suggestions on how to keep these things alive and going and then <laughs> continuing to do our we're direct serve um, districts so we do have full caseloads that we're pulling and um seeing kids in addition to trying to consult and um do more push in universal design service. So I'm right there with you since COVID and since our leadership has changed, we're back at square one. So a lot of our rooms, you know, I like you'll see in my handouts that the rooms that I helped develop were throughout the district. We're a large district. Um, so people called on you to help them or had another therapist. But since COVID and since leadership change, so I'm working with my current SPED leadership to get to the higher level, which is the gen ed and the behavioral, you know, higher leadership, and really take your one or two schools that are proactive. Like, you know, I always say there's a third that buys into the first time you say something, right? There's administrators and really do that. Can you track 
the behavior trackers? Can you talk to your students and ask them what they're finding? You know, and when you can take that qualitative data, not quantitative, because people love to look at numbers. Numbers don't speak in the world of OT, at least not to me, because everything starts from the inside of the body before the brain can even output, right? So really helping our administrators that buy into it and say, let's track for the next four weeks, you know, let's talk to our students or the students on your caseload, if you were pushing in for a regulation or you were trying to go through a sensory pathway with them and asking them, what is their body feeling? What did they notice? Or going back into the classroom after you did that, do you see as your OT lens, are you noticing a difference in their behavior? Are they more focused? And that's what I started doing. I started interviewing my teachers. You know, I would follow these people around and say, okay, tell me, because I knew how to, what questions I was looking for. And pretty soon I just said, tell me what you're seeing. Just tell me, because they don't need to know what I know. And I was getting the answers I was looking for. And so by then taking those testimonials up to the higher, higher leadership, because you're going to only make a bigger change when you teach to, when you impact people with the money, right? Because if you have a behavior specialist that's getting hit and the work, workman's comp is high, like our district right now, something's not working. Bottom line, something's not working. And you and I know that regulation doesn't start at the head, which is social emotional. It starts with the body has to feel, right? The body has to cross midline. And so many of our kids and so many of our teachers, that's one thing I'm finding, they don't have brain development. They, the concept of crossing midline is sometimes a foreign language. I mean, it's unfortunate. So really starting at who needs to hear it is our top management. So start with your SPED director and then take your schools and your students with your highest caseload and say, what if I take their minutes and I take 50% of it and I say, I'm gonna do an indirect way. So it's really us as OT shifting the way we do our own business because we're burning out with the one-on-one -on -one direct service because kids are progressing, but they're progressing developmentally. Not we're not we're not we're not impacting the bridge that we need because teachers aren't carrying over whatever we're doing outside the classroom. And so part of it is we have to start with how can we shift the way we do business? Can we go under support to school personnel, which then gives us the whole gamut where we can go inside the classroom. We can talk to the behavior specialists. We can take them to the regulation room. We can um, come alongside a classroom and, and teach to the whole classroom while we're teaching him, you know, small group. So it's really where are we putting our services and what is our lens saying what's best research, right? So it starts with us. And then it starts with who's who's the buy-in people? They're the ones at the top. And then start with your class, your schools, because anytime we can celebrate a school is a win-win, right? I love what you're saying, Manaz. You have to shout out your successes. So that's certainly what you're doing now. And and I hear you saying so many things that are, are similar to my tra train of thought. So I love that. But we do have to meet people where they are. And in a world where there's so many acronyms and um, so many initiatives going on, uh, I look for the people who make eye contact with me and I go, okay, there's an ally. Uh, I got you pegged. Um, but also looking at, as I just said, the initiatives that are going on, who has a similar initiative that would say that access is part of that? And when we talk about MTSS, of course, that's... It, it, I have over the last year expanded my uh, knowledge to know that I j don't know enough about the MTSS across our state. Because in the past, it was always RTI. In Oregon, it's O-R-T-I-I, -I, instruction and intervention. But um, it has been traditionally a wait to fail model. Now, as in, in my world with technology, we've been working more, and I, I can put a link to a session that I did about in, uh, AIM and assistive technology for the RTI folks, and it's recorded and is on their site about accessibility. They are coming around in knowing that UDL needs to be part of it, but it hasn't changed the uh, verbiage 
Um, and so MTSS or RTI kind of fell out of favor across the country, but it's still here. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be negative about it. It is what it is. But then when I started to look at what are the systems and it's based on the tier models, we've got an early intervention. Now there's an early literacy uh, or early early literacy movement. All of a sudden I lost the name of it, but now there's one that's adolescent. And so they're putting it out there for accessibility and they are built on MTSS systems. So if you're early, early literacy framework, that's it. And now there's an adolescent one. But when we look at our initiatives, these things are starting to cross over into gen ed. So what you said about seeing who your allies are and bringing them together, inventorying your initiatives and see who has the same language written in their, um, in their, their project. I, there was someone, how often do you sit in a meeting and somebody says, okay, we got new grant funding for this and this and this. And it's like, boy, there's a lot of crossover in what we do. Well, I think we need to take advantage of that and see who those people are and um, partner. So I would agree. Um, I found for me personally, I've been, I mean, I've been in the field for 32 years. And I, like I said earlier, I think I was always a visionary. I always saw further. Um, so I think that for me, I found the value. Initially, it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of extra hours of knocking on doors and having meetings with people, but really looking at the strategic plan. And right now, like our district is big on social Social emotional. We know that we have a lot of behavior problems. I mean, we know that post COVID, most schools districts are having trouble with kids coming in dysregulated. You know, uh, big incidents of autism, which many of us know has sensory processing. We know the environment. We know transitions. We know regulation. So really, it's it's we are now the educators to the educators. The students are just the byproduct that got us into the school or into the district, right? IDA brought us in. But now under ESSA, we have now a bigger umbrella, which is still being learned in, in um, the course of Oregon. But under ODE's um, workload, um, what are they doing? Study, whatever they're doing at ODE, they're starting to see that we really can bring a lot more to the table than the one-on-one -on -one student because we're not seeing the impact. We're not seeing the measurable impact when we do one-on-one. -on -one. Where we're gonna get the biggest bang for our buck is really being the educators to the educators under our lens of all the things that we can do. So when we invert, we're actually going to start to see more empowerment and it's starting over. COVID did a number for our district and since then, we're what, four years out, five years out, three years out. And I feel like I'm starting back at pre-COVID conditions. And like Amy, you said about how classrooms are getting, you know, regulation rooms are getting pushed out because now it's the escalation room. We know that ODE and everybody on the behavior, you know, if you look at behavior analysts, why are we not doing things proactively? And OTs were proactive. We know what proactive means. We know task analysis. So when we shift the way we think and say proactively, I can't help this student in a dysregulated room. I can't help this student if you're not gonna provide him the accommodations that were identified. And so it starts with the principle and aligning and relationship building to get them to understand the value because they're their students. And then going to the next level of leadership and saying, these are your students and how I, what I can do is impact the outcome, which is called um, test scores. Because it seems like every district, all they care about is the test score. Well, like I said, back in California, gosh, almost 18 years ago now, there was a teach, there was a principal that saw the value that I was bringing to her as a school and she herself implemented proactive measures and saw benefits at the test score level for a low income district where funding was minimal, but all of what I was teaching her and I brought up, can you guys see my file? See my file? Yes. So all of these things are in your um, handouts. So I think it's in the Google Drive. 
You're going to see it in a Google Drive. Yes, we posted the links. You can get them through the iEcho system, and there is a link in the chat uh, for that. And so a lot of these things cost no money. Almost 90% of it costs no money. And the teachers that I told you about for the environment went through um, either donor choose, MAPS credit union, you know, different grant places, and or even um, uh, garage sales. <laughs> you know, cleaned up the mess and brought it into their classroom. So there are there are ways to work around the funding. But if you get people on board at leadership, at higher leadership, they seem to have people that know how to write grants. And they're sitting behind the doors looking for grants all day long. So it's partnering with them. You know, it's, it's it really, it's a, it's a shift in our own mindset. But I'm hoping that by Take some time to look at these handouts. You'll see some slide presentations that you can tweak. You can take and run with it. You can send off to your people, whatever you want to do. Um, like this whole tier one, you'll have a whole class workshop that's a uh, PowerPoint. You have handouts. You have, you have a whole bunch of stuff that you're welcome to um, tap into. I don't have any problem with you um, adapting it, taking it and running with it, using it. Um, you'll see where the OTSA, what I talked about, this was all by AOTA um, combined with some other people. And so you'll see where it is starting at the national level and how we're pushing it into Oregon. So again, it's shifting the use of OTs in the schools. So we're using broader scope of our practice and having more meaningful um, outcomes. So hopefully- I love it, Manaz. Your free sharing of resources, information is only good if we share it. So that's yeah. so generous of you uh, to, to bring that about. And uh, whenever you look at MTSS, if you go to ODE and you look at, do a search for MTSS, the first one on the list is mental health. Yes. And so that's really the framework I think that we need to be tying to. And you all uh, are trained in mental health. Doesn't mean that you have to be the only ones doing it, but you need to be part of those conversations, obviously. And when we looked at that, it's it, you know underlying with all these things, you said it, helping a, a child make sure that they know that this classroom is made for them. So including multilingual learners and, you know, whenever you're choosing, make sure that you're considering that. And UDL has been around for a long time. Whenever I was at the community college level, I was working, trying to push UDL 20 years ago. And so these are things that are abstract. People can't argue with it, providing those supports. Connecting the dots is what you're doing by sharing these kind of things. And so uh, bringing that into reality. And one other thing I wanted to say is that if you look at Oregon's ESSA plan and you do a search for UDL, Universal Design, there's one mention, OTAP. And so somebody needed to put that language in the plan and that's what they did. I've been taking it quite seriously for a long time. But what happens whenever you're kind of pegged in you know, special ed, and, and then getting that information across uh, to the gen ed side, we know that has to happen. So um, we just have to keep going at it and, and persisting because we're going to get no's, we're going to get people that don't understand, but um, we just have to keep at it. So I keep saying it's one school, one principal, one district. <laughs> And then you see the final outcomes and you will see the outcomes. And um, like I shared the, some of the testimonials, you will you will feel empowered that other people are seeing how to generalize your skills by setting up the program that doesn't require the skills of an OT. And I think, again, it's going from scarcity to more abundance that sharing my skills with the whole school is actually going to bring more positive um, outcomes for me as a therapist, like work, work satisfaction, um, you know, creativity, all of those things. So I wanted to share with you, this is what I send to my administrators and you're welcome to adapt this or whatever. These are my tier ones um, in services that I can offer them. Some of them could be as much as just teach, talking to a teacher in a classroom during her prep time. Um, 
But these are all workshops that you should be able to see most of those handouts in um, in your folder. But this is just things that I talk about to um, my principals when I come in and say, where do we want to start? Here's my, here's my caveat for tier one. What can I do to help you? Um, so hopefully this will give you guys some um, brain juice to think about what can I, what of this can I maybe pull out and talk to my principal if I can't give them a whole school um, workshop, what can I do to think about changing the way I do business? So I just wanted to offer you that. There's also the tier two and a tier three model. But um, so I just wanted to make sure that you understand what's in those handouts and that this was just more of an overview to get your juices going on where are we in UDL and what is our role as OTs at the school level and at the district level. If the administrator's on, if she can share, was there anything, any takeaways from this workshop that were ahas for you or anything that we can learn from your perspective on where the barriers are in utilizing OTs in your schools? Is the administrator on still? I don't know everybody's role. The one person that I saw, I don't see uh, out there okay. right now, but other people may be administrators. I just had my eye on. Okay, one. that's fine. Um, um, so let's end the end it. We have a few more minutes. Um, any ahas? Any other questions? Any empowerments? Any frustrations that you're like, this is great, but good luck on implementing it. Um, any kind of moments where I'm like, I'm going to try one thing or two things out of what was say, stated today. I see lots of thank yous and, and the kind sharing of your information, Manaz, you have inspired and uh, people are, uh, here we are October and, and you know, a couple months have gone by. Uh, you, it, it's easy to feel like you're not making progress, but we're celebrating all of those and you've given information and inspiration. I don't wanna say too, that our next session in two weeks um, is going to be kind of in line uh, Chandra is going to be talking uh, about um, Google accessibility. And so uh, when you look at the systems that you are in, um, Google is very prominent, as is Apple. So we'll start with what are those tools that are built in? And you you can always start there with the trial, with the text to speech, et cetera. So in two weeks, Chandra is going to be sharing that with us. We will follow up at some point with a, a, an Apple session. But just looking at if you can start with those things that everybody has access to, then you're building uh, competence and, and a comfortable um, attitude towards technology. And it's not 20 different apps that people are intimidated by with 20 different platforms. And so just finding some commonality um, and simplify.